Hey guys, this is Igor Smirnov from the Remote Chess Academy. Today we're celebrating the 8th anniversary of the Remote Chess Academy. And of course, most importantly, we're celebrating your successes over these years. Because the Remote Chess Academy was created to help you. And therefore, of course, mainly our anniversary means that we're celebrating your successes. And uh, apart from that, today I will be answering your questions. So if you have any questions, do not hesitate. Write them right here in comments and I will try to catch up and to answer all of them. Hey guys, I see that more and more people are coming. If you came here, just write something in comments so that I see who are you. And it will be easier for me to address you personally, to answer your questions. Meanwhile, while you're coming up with your questions, I'll just command in general about uh, the RCA and I'll try to give some tips for you that will be helpful for you for your progress. First of all, the first thing that I'm gonna say in general about this celebration is that we're always looking forward for our chess development and at times we're not happy with some of the goals that we did not achieve or some of the victories we didn't gain. But I think it's really important at times to take a moment, and stop and look back. And when you look back you see how far have you gotten. You see this long distance that you've came through. And therefore it is really pleasant to celebrate this victory. Alright. Also don't forget to hit like buttons so that more of your friends will get to know about this event. The more people will come the more good questions we will receive and so the more interesting it will become. I see the new guys are coming. Welcome. Uh, don't forget to write your questions in comments area. Here we're celebrating the 8th anniversary of the Remote Chess Academy. And I'm Grandmaster Igor Smirnov, here at your service, welcoming to answer your questions. And just a few tips in general from the vast experience of RCA from the thousands of students who studied there. Let me just tell you a few general tips. All right? So the tip number one is very simple. Do not reinvent the wheel. You see, whenever I get new questions from students, very often I know that those are typical questions. So those doubts about chess that you may be having, in fact, there could be thousands of other people who have the same doubts about chess. So if you think that, in general, you're playing well, but you're bad at some openings, or you think that at the beginning of the tournament, you're not at, at your, your best shape, or sometimes you feel that you're getting slightly more nervous than you would wish to and that uh, damages your chess performance. Or that you can play a good game but it's sometimes you blunder, maybe at the time pressure. And there could be, you know, the long list of situations that you're worrying about, that you're thinking how to overcome. But the matter of the fact is, they are very typical situations. So instead of reinventing the wheel and trying to come up with the solutions yourself, it is so much easier to just take the readily available solutions already developed by other people. So that's the first main tip. Uh, let me also take another pause to welcome the new people who just joined us. It's great that you came. I'm uh, delighted to talk to you today. We're celebrating the 8th anniversary of the Remote Chess Academy. Don't forget to shoot your questions in comments. Any questions about chess, about RCA, about me, or whatever you have, preferably about chess, I'll be willing to answer them. And I see already the first guy, perhaps from India, says hi. Yeah, hi to you. Nice to see you here. Alright, so meanwhile, I'll keep uh, talking with the general tips about RC and what are we doing here. And you're welcome to keep shooting out your questions. I see the new comment. Your classes are very good. Thank you. Thanks for your support. And um, Ray writes to us, thanks for the events, Igor. We improved a lot. Yeah, thank you for your comment. By the way, I have to tell you that also, I gotta really thank you for all your support. Because through these years, it has been eight years that uh, the RC exists. And through these years, I got a lot of feedback from you. And so that helped me to improve the lessons. And we got another question from uh, Lovro. So, hi Lovrum, nice to meet you. Hi Igor, thanks for this stream. So, we recently had Croatian League and I won seven games in a row easily. 
but then I lost to a lower rating component, which was so surprising to me. Well, first of all, Lovro, uh, it's great that you got this uh, big success, and that's actually exactly what we're celebrating today. Uh, we're celebrating the successes of the RCA students. And uh, let me just write through this question. I thought I would always win easily against such rated players who are 1500 rating. Um, well, Lovro, that's also one of the typical situations actually. The thing is, sometimes you play very well and you win games even against stronger opponents, but then at a certain day just you, you may fall down. And that is normal, because uh, nobody can play perfectly. If you look at Magnus Carlsen, also his rating may decline at times and in some tournaments his results drop down. So that is normal for every, for every one of us. To rectify this fact, there are just two main things that you need to do. The one thing is that it's very important to prevent blunders and miscalculations. Because usually the lower rating opponent cannot outplay you. So he can only win if uh, you really make some bad mistake. And that is why in order to rectify this fact, you, you gotta really prevent blunders. Uh, check out the lessons, we have free lessons how to prevent blunders, check them out and you'll uh, get rid of such annoying losses. Anyway, let me see the next questions. What's best to develop first, knights or bishop? Um, asks us Clyde. Um, Clyde, it's better to develop knights first. The rule was stated by the second world champion a uh, long time ago. And uh, it's just because the bishops are already active from their original square, while the knight needs to be brought to the place of action to be active. And that is why. Okay, I'm writing the, reading the next question. As your knowledge in psychology, you are the very best person to teach chess. Thank you very much. Thank you for high evaluation. Uh, yeah, I think chess is pure psychology. This is our brain work. So it's <laughs> very good to, to understand it. The next question, what opening do you recommend us to play uh, with the e4 pawn in blitz games? Um, well, I didn't fully get it whether you're asking whether you should be playing e4 or what to play against. But against e4, I think Scandinavian defense is a very good one if you're playing black. So the first move, you play d5, and if you do that, uh, you can start the counterattack right from the very first move, which is very essential in blitz games, because in blitz, the top priority for you it is to create troubles for your opponent. If you trouble him, he'll start thinking, and either you will win because of your chess superior position or because your opponent will be in time trouble. Okay, let me keep reading. I see the new people are coming. So, hey guys, don't hesitate to write your comments. I'll try to answer them all. And the next question is, can you list your thinking system by heart? Well, of course, my thinking system, definitely. I think that your thinking system should be totally automated. So that, like, if somebody wakes you up in the night, you can wake up and tell it <laughs> what you're going to do. Because in a chess game or in a blitz game, you have only a few seconds to make your choice, to make the right move. And therefore, it should be fully automated. So first of all, like, I'll give you the shortened version of the system of thinking. So first of all, you look at the opponent's half of the board and think what damage can you put there? What are the attacking force moves that you can make there? If there is something, you make it, and if there is nothing, you just improve your position. And before playing a move, you make sure that it's not a blunder. So that's the shorter version of the right thinking system. Um, the next question, you're the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you like it, don't forget to hit like button. More people will come, will be aware of this fact. More good questions we will receive. Now, the next question. Igor, can you please explain the difference between a tactical player and a positional player? How can a person find out which works best for him or for her? Well, here, first of all, I love the statement that um, one of the former world champions, Karpov, said. He said that if there is a choice, the equal choice between two moves, he would prefer the positional move. But if he believes that the move is the best, he will do it no matter how sharp or complicated it is. Because in that sense, if you are avoiding some side of the game, like either tactical or positional, then it's just your weakness. It's not your style, it's a weakness. So therefore, um, in order to find out who are you and which style is yours, you just pick the games that you want. 
from the database of your games, you select the games that you want and you look through them and you will very easily notice the trend in what kind of situations and what kind of openings you win more often. Now the next comments are coming so I'll have to um, keep reading. The next one from Yuri is, are you single? No I'm not, I have the wife. She's also playing chess by the way, we met at a chess tournament. Uh, the next question from Lovro once again. In the game I pushed d4 as black attacking his bishop and then when I am criticized because I define structure too early. That is was better to get more pieces but I tried to follow your principle of attack. Well it's of course a little bit hard to comment on that without knowing the situation but in general I would say that if you can attack you should be doing that. That's great. It's always great. And um, meanwhile, let me also just quickly recap that we are celebrating the 8th anniversary of the Remote Chess Academy. I'm answering your questions and therefore if you just came because new people are coming, so I'm quickly recollecting that. Shoot out your questions, don't hesitate, write them in comments. I'm desperately trying to catch up and to answer them all. Um, the next one, uh, can you tell the best books about chess? Um, well, if it's uh, maybe it's not very humble from my side, but uh, my book, a promoted book, I can definitely recommend, um, because there I summarized my whole experience about chess, so and about my chess journey. So I think if you read it through, it'll be much easier for you to go through the same path much faster. And uh, the other good books is, is uh, Zurich International by David Bernstein, uh, the book by Keres, 100 Open Games, also very good. And the books of uh, famous players of the past I love a lot. If you can find uh, Capablanca, Alyokhin, the former world champions, one of the first of them, they are all are absolutely great. The next one, how can I maintain my advantage? Like if I have a space advantage, how do I maintain that kind of advantage? How can I maintain my one piece up advantage from Emmanuel? Well, when you are heading material, uh, the easiest thing you can do is to trade off the pieces because that um, eliminates the opportunity of counterplay from the side of your opponent. It will be easier for you to convert. The next question comes from Robert. I've been playing online as a hobby for a year. I'm rated up to 1700. How should I best spend my time to get better at my level? Uh, well. You know, I have limited time right here, so I would rather recommend uh, my free course. You can find it, uh, Chess Trading Plan for Rapid Improvement. You can find it on my website or just Google it, you'll find it easily. And there I've summarized uh, the easiest trading methods. It's free, so check, the, check it out. The next question, what do you feel about the London system? Question comes from Robert. Um, thank you for the question. London system gains in popularity over the last years. There were a few courses about it released by some title players and people play it because uh, they love the fact that they can keep playing the same setup always in their game and they don't have to think. Even though for chess like it never hurts if you start thinking. <laughs> but people love when they can keep, keep it easy. Um, I think that if you always play London you're like limiting your own abilities to develop your chess understanding because in order to learn something new you gotta have more experience. And if you always limit yourself to one position, it's not a very good choice. Now, the next question from Richard. I buy all of your chess training program. I just want to say that I love your training course. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your feedback. I really appreciate that. And for those of you who just came, let me welcome you once again. We're celebrating the 8th anniversary of the RCA. And I'm feeling like the news reporter who are trying to say a lot of information within a very short time frame. <laughs> so I'm desperately trying to catch up with your comments. Um, don't be upset if I miss something, I'll answer it later on. Uh, the next question, uh, do you think an aggressive and speculative player like Tal or Nizhmedinov could emerge amongst the young computer-like players? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Nakamura, great example. He, I believe he learned from Tal a lot. He said that Tal was his one of the role models. So yeah, attack is always great. And again, you're not playing against computer. You're playing against human beings. Those that are emotional and those that are 
bad defenders and stuff like that. So th that style will work out very well. Then the next question uh, from Robert, who are your favorite chess YouTuber? Um, well, I partner with uh, Trifon Gavriel. We even created the course together um, about the attack. Uh, so I think his videos are very entertaining. They're a little bit in a different style because I'm trying to be more educational and he also sometimes shows just the beauty of chess as the good chess games. But in any case, he's very good. The next question. Um, what do you know about Matix chess? Uh, I don't get it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Maybe you could specify what that is. And the next question from Steven, uh, like, uh, worth studying Tarish or Marshall? Well, the Tarish is a very classical player, yeah, you, you may study him for sure. Um, of course, modern players would say that he was too rigid, too old-fashioned, but still, I mean, the classical rules about chess, he put them in a very straightforward manner, so I think if you learn from him, they'll be helpful. The next question from Bobby. At what time and date will the next GM hit ELO rating of 3000 and state that rating for entire one year? Uh, well, it's hard to predict, uh, but your question, of course, is um, very likely to become true someday. And mainly not because people get so much better in chess, but just because of the inflation of ratings. So Carlson stated that he has that goal to reach 300 uh, rating, uh, to cross this barrier. Of course, he has the best chances, but uh, I would be in a hard situation to predict exactly when that's going to happen. Now, the next question comes from Ray. Would you recommend to play the Alapin variation with C3 against the Sicilian defense? Well, in short, no. I would not recommend playing it all the time, but just for some separate games you're very much welcome to give it a try to any opening that you wish. Meanwhile, let me quickly recap that we're celebrating the 8th anniversary of Rhythm Mode Chess Academy and your victories along the way, all your, of your victories that you acquired along these years. So let me congratulate you with, with all of your victories that you got. And now let me continue answering your questions. Um, the question from Fabio how do you explain that the more a player reaches books, the more he becomes weaker and weaker? Uh, yeah, that's a, a kind, of, kind of a sad situation, but it reminds me of one of the, my experiences. The absolutely worst tournament that I played in my lifetime was after I trained chess like hell, like 10 hours a day I was training like crazy, and then I played the worst tournament of my life. It happens because you go astray, because when you train on yourself, you just go off the right path and it is so easy. That's why if you don't train with a coach or if you don't have the good community of chess players that you can interact with, it's so much important to stay on track and to check all of your ideas with the computer at least to make sure that you don't go you know, off the right path. The next question. Thanks for being so truthful about your chess courses. I admire the way you teach your amazing uh, idol, GM Smirnov. Yeah, thank you very much for such high evaluation. Of course, it's very pleasant. Don't forget to hit like button if you like this event. So that will keep going. Uh, the next question is, Agar Calculation Book is good or not? Yeah, he's a f quite a famous author. I didn't check all of his books, but I assume that they should be good. Uh, the next question from Ed, your thoughts on the Parham attack? Sorry, I didn't, didn't know what that is. Maybe you could specify the moves, because maybe I know the, the line, but, not, but didn't know that it is called that way. Now, let me keep scrolling the questions. The next question from Robert. Calculation is hard for me. What is the easiest way to do it? Well, the easiest way to calculate properly is to get rid of the moves which are unsound from the positional perspective. And that's why I introduce my chess principles in my courses. So that if you realize that a certain moves are just not following the right strategy, 
you can deduct them from your tree of operations without even considering them. And that'll make your task a lot easier. Karachnoi, one of the contenders for the World Championship title, said uh, the better you understand chess, the less moves you have to calculate. And here we go. Ah, that's the Parham attack that you were asking about. It's about e4, e5, queen h5. Well, that's a bad opening. It violates the opening principles, but if you just wish to play it in some not very serious blitz games to surprise your opponents, or maybe they will um, overlook the fact that you're attacking the e5 pawn, occasionally it's fine to play it for fun, but in general I would not recommend that you do it. Now, the next question comes, how useful is it to play chess against the computer to improve? Well, it's a very good question, because it is, of course, very useful to play against computer, but um, just there is no need to play too often, because if you always lose, it's not very encouraging for your chess progress. That's why I would recommend that you do it occasionally. But if you play occasionally, that's very good, and as I said earlier, that'll help you to stay on track. Uh, right, but to play against computer, of course, you have to be, you have to have the strong character, so that uh, if you lose, you're not going to be depressed about that. Now, the next question: Will this be recorded to watch later? The question comes from Lovro. I hope so. Actually, it's the first Facebook Live event that I'm doing, so I hope that I will not uh, click some wrong button at the end and will not erase that video, <laughs> which I will try to avoid. So I'll try to save this video. Yes. Now, the next question comes, uh, why do I beat masters with that opening, uh, e4, e5, and queen h5? Well, I guess it's because you're a very talented player. Nakamura also played queen h5, uh, that uh, little bit weird line, and he won a lot of games. Uh, so, yeah, congratulations. There was one famous player of the past, Begalubov, and he said, um, I win with white uh, because white is superior, and I win with black because I'm Begalubov. So I guess that relates to you as well. If you can win against masters with even with weird openings, it just means that you're a very strong player. Uh, the next question comes, how much time spent Grandmaster uh, of 2500 rating? Uh, I don't get the rating fully. Maybe you mean how much time for training per day the Grandmaster spends, or how much time does it take to become a Grandmaster? I don't know. Um, well, people always ask me about the shortcuts. To be awarded with the Grandmaster title, sure. So I have prepared the solution for you. I, can you see this chest tie? Mm -hmm. With the paces, it's supposed to be placed like, like here on the neck. And if you come like this in the office of the World Chess Federation, maybe they'll award you the GM title right away, without any extra examinations. At least you may give it a try. <laughs> Why not? Um, or if you wish more thoughtful answer, you could try to specify your question. What do you mean by that? Then I'll try to come up with a better answer. Meanwhile, let me just uh, recap that it is the celebration of the 8th anniversary of the Remote Chess Academy and all of your victories during these years, because I think it's very important and uh, it just adds up a lot of pleasure when you just realize how many victories you have gotten over the course of these years. When you're not not only focused on the problems that you have, but also on so many great victories that you achieved and that you improved your chess so greatly. All right, then let me check up the next questions from Eduardo. If a chess player about 2100 FIDE don't study opening, only study end game theory, middle game tactics and decision taking, what is your opinion about? Well, I think that in general, for that level, opening preparation is not that critical, so I'm with you. I think that you can just spend your time on improving your overall understanding of chess, and that is good enough. There was one tournament when a Grandmaster Sveshnikov played a3 as the first move in every of his uh, white games, and still he won the tournament, just because, I mean, sometimes the opening isn't that critical. All right. So, let me quickly remind you that we're celebrating uh, the anniversary of RCA. All your questions are welcome. Write them in comments. And if you enjoy the event, hit like so that it keeps going. And I'm trying to not to take too much of your time, but still to answer your question. 
Now, the next question from Ray. How to deal with pressure in a tournament when you're always playing in the first table? Huh. First of all, it's very good that you're always playing in the first table. It's a very good uh, trouble to deal with. Uh, to be more serious, uh, Mikhail Tal, the former world champion, said that uh, said the following. Uh, he said, I was always very nervous before the decisive games and it just helped me a lot when I realized that it's, I was not the only one who was so much nervous, but it was also my opponent who felt nervous just as much. So if you realize that, that your opponents are in the same trouble, you know, that they'll uh, release the pressure off you. Now the next question from Jonathan. Hi Igor. Yeah, hi. It's nice to meet you again. The next question. Scandinavian Knight of Six is best for all level. Oh, very nice statement. Maybe not everybody would agree with you, but if you're confident in your opening knowledge, then why not to give it a try? All right, Ken asks. I'm very much curious to know how many moves a Grandmaster can think, can think ahead. I guess that's the question. Uh, well, you would be surprised to know that, uh, although in some rare cases there are situations when a Grandmaster can calculate like 20 moves ahead, but those are very exceptional situations. In the very most of the cases, the Grandmasters are actually not calculating that much. The main difference between a Grandmaster and an amateur player is their level of strategic understanding. And if your, when your strategic understanding raises up, that helps you to reduce the amount of calculation you have to do. And of course, there are also other Grandmaster secrets. I've prepared some of them for you. Like, do you have an idea of what's this? If you have any ideas, write them in comments. Originally, when I saw it, I thought it's the alien's chicken leg. But then I had to drop that idea. But it's one of the Grandmaster secrets, I believe. So this is to massage your brain. You see, when you do it like that, and you massage your brain, so I hope it is supposed to start working better. One of the Grandmaster secrets. Because people ask me sometimes, what are the secrets of Grandmasters? What makes them special? So I had to prepare something for you to explain this. Uh, Alright, let's get serious once again. We're celebrating the 8th anniversary of RC, shooting out your questions. I'll be answering them. And if uh, you're enjoying it, don't forget to like the event.